Hello. Today I will be showing you some clips being from the being from the field trip I just did. Enjoy. Well, I'm finally here. I'm gonna put this right here. Where? Here. So, I, I haven't, you know, I haven't ran this field trip since last spring. And every time you come out, you never know what might be a little different or what may have changed. Uh, I'm sad to see, I, I had a really favorite like boulder that was sitting down here that I like to kind of start with and it seems to be gone. So, so I've got I've to change up my, my speed here just a little bit here at the beginning, but let's see here. So I don't know if everybody can see, but we're, we're at an outcrop and imagine that we're geologists. We've come out, we're, we're looking at that crop, we have no idea what we're looking at, you know? At one of our first orders of business would be like, hey, what kind of rock am I looking at? You know, basic rock identification, you know, that, that we've done in lab. In this case, we have the benefit, we know we're looking at sedimentary rocks, we're in the valley and ridge, so, you know, a lot of times at this stage in geology, we have a lot of information going into a site. We're not like looking at this truly for the first time, other people have done this, but I might come up, I might not really be sure what I'm looking at. I always like to carry my, my acid bottle with me in the field, so let me see if, uh, can you guys see that? Yeah. Oh yeah, the effervescence? it's fizzing. All right, so, so that means broadly speaking, what kind of rock must this be? Carbonate. Yeah, it's definitely carbonate. So it's some kind of limestone. Yes, it's... it's now, those of you who so, have been in lab, you may remember there was more than, you know, we didn't just call something a limestone. We tried to then be a little yeah, more specific. Yeah, different kinds of limestone, so, like an example being ooh, like, so yeah, meaning this was in a shallow sea right. environment. So, being, just and think about, of course. Think about the limestones you guys identified in lab. You had things like chalk, coquina, fossiliferous limestone. You had something called micrite, and, which was, you know, just. And kind of also chalk. Uh, being the most limestone, famous. You mentioned. So that's going to be one of the other things I'll start looking for. Is there some other features? Can I be more specific? And this is why I'm I'm, I'm upset. My favorite rock is gone because. Yeah, that it does really suck. Nice and this. But. And of course, of course, again, this rock being about 515 million years old. Looking at, of course. So again, this is something that we had in the lab. We had little hand lenses. They were part of the kit. We really didn't have a lot of need for them. You may have picked them up and looked at a few things with them, mostly under the microscope. So, so I don't really see what I was looking for in this sample, but what I do see. Um, is, hey, can I see yeah, that? Yeah, if I get up really close, take it home with you. Unless you got the hand lens. But if I get up really close, there's little hmm. tiny spheres, little spherical grains. And so when you see that, and I got a, so I got a hand lens here, and I got a, another one. If anybody wants to uh, come and take a look in a second with the hand lens, of course, I'll kind of leave it here for you guys to look. But if you get a close, you hey, want to look at this? Sure, thank you. They're really weathered. They're not as nice as maybe the ooids you saw in lab, but they're there. So let me kind of set the scene here a little bit. If we've got oolitic limestone with little ooids in them, already we can begin to make some environmental interpretations as to what was going on in the past. So we know it's limestone, that kind of puts us in a marine environment. We've got ooids, so now we're okay, well, shallow, 
We have some nice oscillating currents that are kind of swashing these carbonate grains back and forth. So they're building up a little bit of calcite, getting that nice feel. So it shape. was also in a coastal environment as well as shallow. So when this stuff wasn't a limestone yet, and it was just loose sediment, it might have looked something like this here. A bunch of just oolitic sand, you know, that would have been accumulating along a shallow sea floor. So, so true chemical precipitation. This one's got yeah, what? It does have some ooze in it. All right, so we got a little piece here. Yeah, it, I definitely could tell from the texture. And yeah, you can see there's little, little spherical grains there. Set that piece there. You guys check it out. So what we're looking at right here, we're looking at a rock formation that has, of course, been identified. It's been named as all the, the formations out here have. But if you look at a geologic scale here, kind of showing just a segment of the valley and ridge, down here there's a formation. This is in the field trip pan out I gave you as well, so you can check it there. And uh, let me and know if you need to get one. But the Conica Cheek formation. You can see we're right down here, right at the very end of the Cambrian period of time. So that's what this formation is. And back when this stuff was uh, nice oolitic sands, the scene might have looked a little something like this. So, 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 so I noticed that like part of the end of Virginia is still land, but like where? Where? You know, the scene isn't quite what it what it is today. You can see there's a little sliver, the western part of Virginia, sort of the southwest, uh, southwest portion. It's sort of there and accounted for, but a lot of what will be Virginia is sitting out here in this, this ocean basin. And you can see there's a bit of a continental shelf out here. So there's some shallow sea where this stuff has basically been accumulating. Okay, so, you know, just from these quick kind of very rapid identifications, limestone, oolitic, you know, without seeing this map, I've already kind of painted that picture for myself that I'm in these warm, shallow tropical seas. Note here, the orientation, I try to orient this poster so that north is kind of pointing actually to the top. You can see North America is, is not in the orientation it is today. It's, it's further south. We're kind of straddling the equator. What you think of as the east coast is really would have been like the southern coast uh, in that period of time. So, you know, things have been sort of rotated up to where we are today. Annals. So let's let's see what else we can see. Now I'm gonna leave this hand lens here. Try not to let me forget it. There's the little sample here. If you wanted to just take a quick look there, you might be able to spit, uh, spot a few of these little oolitic grains. But we're gonna see some more evidence of that stuff right over here as well. Where you get oolitic sands so you get the oscillation, but there's also dominant currents that are kind of moving those oolitic sands one way or the other. So you can also then get some cross -cut. Now the nice thing here, it's, it's somewhat visible because you got all these little grains, they've been cross -bedded. As the rock erodes, you get just enough differential weathering, a little you know change in the uh, rate of erosion that kind of helps these little grains and cross -bed sort of poke out in relief. For the most part though, this rock, when you just kind of glance at it, if you don't have features like that, it looks kind of just gray and, and nondescript and not that exciting. But if you get up close, you can actually start making these environmental uh, observations. So from right there to here, we've got basically sort of lytic limestone, but it's going to change just a little bit as we move just a little further down here along this outcrop. So take a look at the Yeah, still that's enough. I actually own some myself, and and I'm sure as you would learn if you look them up, you. Now, stromatolites still exist today, but they're not nearly as prevalent as they used to be. So one of the places you still can find them is in Australia, the World Heritage Site called Shark Bay. And uh, 
You basically so have a whole bunch of stromatolites that are still living and thriving there. And stromatolites, I mean, we have good evidence that, you know, going back about three and a half billion years ago, that there was microbial life, algae existed. Uh, the existence of that photosynthetic algae, you know, is a big, you know, contributor what gave us all, all the oxygen in our atmosphere. But for several billions of years, at least uh, from about 3.5 up until the start of the Cambrian, you know, say maybe 570 million years ago, the stromatolites, the algae, they had a really good run of things. There's nothing really that they had to worry about. But starting in the Cambrian, when these stromatolites, when this algae, when they, when the sun set at night and they laid their little algal heads down to go to sleep and drifted off to dreamland, they started having nightmares in the Cambrian because all of a sudden a new threat had arrived on the scene that they never had to worry about before. And that main primary threat, the thing that Get stromatolites waking up screaming in the middle of the night. <laughs> it's the thought of gastropods, little wow. snails that have arrived on the scene in the Cambrian that, oh, they love to eat the algae. They're little herbivorous grazers, like little lawnmowers, just working their way across the algal mats, loving life and eating it up. Of course, at these guys' detriment. And so around the Cambrian is when we sort of essentially start to see. I mean, it's not that this stuff doesn't exist, we still have algae but their sort of prevalence in the scene is, is greatly diminished from that point forward. And, and we need only certain places to find it. Yeah. And also another creature would be some of the earliest ancestors of all vertebrates, so, which includes Pikea and Haiku ichthys, which during most fish during this time would have been scum feeders as well, since they would have yeah. been jawless. Absolutely. So, I mean, we certainly have some stuff in the Precambrian that was getting in there too. Yeah. Are those stromatolites similar to the stuff at Yellowstone? Like those, uh, what are those, uh, those like a bacterial it's, stuff? It's, it's similar. So it's, it's the same basic kinds of process. Those, some of that algae is probably not as closely related to this because it's sometimes it's living in those extreme environments, those hot thermal vents. And so there's a little bit different chemistry, but same basic idea. They're living in those kinds of environments. Yeah. Uh, could the, uh, could the trilobites eat I mean, one of those algae suits? I'll say they... trilobites probably wouldn't have been, I mean, it's not that there aren't, I think so. Most trilobites were basically carnivorous. So they're actually, we're looking for other organisms to prey on and not so much, you know, you can kind of think of this as more like a veggie, you know, uh, than, than anything else. So. Yeah, I was kind of thinking about it, but I have heard of some trilobites that are carnivorous. So... So the, the thing with stromatolites today where they do exist and why they're able to survive and thrive in Australia, this location has to do with the salinity of the water. It's really hyper saline. You can kind of see it's very shallow. You get kind of a, an intense concentration of, of salt in that water. And I don't know if you guys have ever been really cruel to a snail or slug and, you know, put salt on it or anything, but you probably know those snails generally aren't real favor, you know, they're not real fond of salty conditions. And so the hypersaline conditions of Shark Bay make it pretty intolerant for most organisms. And so the algae's got a pretty good go of it here. There's no real natural predators that they have to worry about. And so you can still get these stromatolite, these algal mats that grow at that location. All right. So again, though, still telling the same story of shallow tropical seas. One last thing I want to show you guys. Circles, yeah. Oh, oh. So those are like weathering. So it's just a superficial, or superficial uh, kind of weathering pattern. So it's oh, water so it's and stuff. Kind of, yeah. So water kind of lands on there and, and just kind of creates these interesting. Okay. change over time to get more of a ground but you can see we've got a small cave right here so i just want to point out you know we're looking at limestones limestones you know i hit it with acid just a little yeah, while ago it, it reacted so a little bit of acidity acidity is going to weather these rocks away much more quickly than other more resistant rocks 
So if you're familiar with this area, the Shenandoah Valley, you know there's lots of caves and caverns here. You may have heard of Luray Caverns. Well, it's because they're all basically in these limestone formations. And so the limestone much more easily dissolves away, produces these caverns. And these little places here where you get caverns, you might notice there's sort of like a, a little apron or, or sort of fan of, of sort of soil that seems to sort of be kind of coming out. It's a little bit overgrown. You kind of see there's a sort of reddish dirt here that's kind of like coming out of that hole. Mm -hmm. So we always talk about these limestones as being, you know, carbonate sediment, you know, chemical precipitation from seawater. But it doesn't mean it's all calcium carbonate. It's not necessarily that pure. And sure, we're offshore in this sort of shallow marine environment, but there's still a little bit of plastic material, some clay, maybe some silts that make their way out there to those shallow uh, seas and kind of settle in amongst all this carbonate sediment. And so when we start to kind of dissolve away the limestone, essentially dissolving the calcium carbonate away, the clastic material is still there. It doesn't dissolve. And so that begins to kind of spill out, often as this kind of red oxidized sediment or soil. So if you're ever in an area where there's a lot of limestone and you're trying to find a cave or a cavern, one of the things you would maybe look for would be places where you see sort of this sort of red dirt or soil kind of spilling out from maybe a crack or fracture or location along a limestone outcrop. You might be looking at a place where there's been some uh, dissolution and the limestone's actually been dissolved away to maybe uh, produce a full-blown cave or cavern. So just to know that it's limestone, but there's just a little bit of plastic material that's in there as well. Yeah, 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 because I, yeah, I was wondering if there's gotta be, there's gotta be some plastic material here somewhere. Right, so it, it's just to kind of show that it's not all, all chemical uh, precipitates, so. Yeah, I could definitely see how it is classic and how it is very fine grade rock because of how gr small the grades right. are unless you met unless you look at them with a magnifying glass so does anybody have any questions <laughs> so maybe although a lot of what you see on these surfaces yeah. is just this kind of surface weathering so it's stuff that's kind of if we were to kind of saw or break this open we might not see so much like although again in a sample like this yeah like all this discoloration is really probably just staining from just runoff and material kind of running over this and sort of the truth but you can this see it there's holding yeah you got yeah some, i could so these are probably some little you know thin stromatolite algal mat layers just oh, kind of wow. that have been built up and yeah you can see there's just even just that little hint of a curvature going on there that kind of lets you know that that's maybe biological <laughs> As much nah. as yeah, that's, definitely. That's awesome. Thank so, you. I'm gonna right. keep it. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, any any little rocks or samples you pick up today, by all means, you know, yeah. feel free to take them with and put them in your pocket. So this this outcropping here and that outcropping there, this is because they put this highway. Right. Yeah. So maybe just real quick, another good thing to sort of mention to you guys is that concept of lateral continuity, right? So we're looking at these rocks here that are poking out on the side of the road. Keep in mind, these rocks, you know, they extend off that way into the, you know, into the hillside and for miles and miles. The rocks you see right over there, you know, it's the same stuff over here. It used to be connected until they, you know, cut a road through here. So that's why we call these road cuts. But again, you know, this formation continues across and off that direction into the hill. So this whole, all of this, this sand bit has been, is just the, this stuff weathering just within the last few years of them making this yeah, highway. Yeah, and I'm not it's sure when. It's a pretty fast went. erosion. Oh yeah, it's quick. I mean, you, you got to West Virginia, there's some new sections of highway that they built like maybe five years ago, and they're, they're still working on it, but the new sections they opened up when they first opened it, the outcrops are great because they were freshly exposed, but even within just five to six years, Stuff starts to grow over them. They start, you know, runoff starts to stay in the outside surface. You know, the, the outer look of these rocks often doesn't look that attractive. You have to, you know, we often bring out rock hammers and we basically break off pieces of rock so we can see the fresh, unweathered surfaces. That's really what, you know, helps us identify it. What you see out here on this, there's a lot of staining, you know, runoff from the soil up above, stains the rock. It gives it a lot of surface features that can be deceiving, making you think, oh, there's something really interesting happening here. And it's, nah, it's just, it's just the weather on the surface. The, 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 the stuff inside hasn't changed at all, so. 
Any other thoughts or questions about this outcrop? Yeah. How did you find it? How did I find this? So, so I'm I'm standing on the, the shoulders of giants uh, before me. So, uh, you know, I've been out here with other geologists who brought me here. So that's how I know about it. If you trace it back far enough, there's geologists, some, some folks basically, you know, going back to the early days of Virginia, early days of the colonies, who trekked out here and just made notes, made the observations. They wouldn't have seen this yet because it was uh, wasn't a road here. But they would have looked at places where it's cropped out, and from that time since, people just return and go back out. And initially, it's usually looking for like, hey, where are the good resources? What's the, where are the building stones we want to use? Where's the minerals that we want to extract for industrial uses? Or you know, where's the gold? That kind of stuff. But over over time, you know, you build up this body of knowledge of like, what rocks are out here, what you can find, and people take us here. So. I think you found a live snail. What? Oh. <laughs> yeah, some, some live gastropods. Uh, oh, yes, some of those creatures that <laughs> the Stromat likes are afraid right. of. Well, let's, let's, that let's head back on to the their young. And we'll get on to our next stop. That's cool. We should keep that. Can I see it? Yeah. Yeah, definitely very impressive. the Mulberry Run stop because there's a little creek that runs right near there called Mulberry Run. This stop we call the Tumbling Run stop. That's Tumbling Run right there next to us. Yeah, that, uh, we, we were kind of following along it as we were making our way down to you maybe notice the creek. That was Tumbling Run as well. But we've, we basically we have come from a position that was just a little bit further west. We've moved a little further east. And we've moved up in our stratigraphic sequence. We are no longer in the Kanakochi formation. We've moved up into the Ordovician time period. And we're going to see three formations here at this outcrop. The Newmarket, Lincolnshire, and Edinburgh limestone. But we're going to see some really distinctive changes as we uh, move from here down to that end. Sort of a, a simplified view of this outcrop in the show here. So you maybe noticed at the last stop, you hopefully definitely see it here that all of these rock layers are, are tilted, right? They're they're at an angle. These are no longer in their original horizontal position. There's been some kind of folding taking place. That big ridge you see over there in the distance, that's Massanut Mountain over there. We're gonna end up on the interior of that later in the afternoon. But basically these layers are dipping down, tilted. They're plunging down into the subsurface beneath the ground. And if we were to sort of trace along these, uh, these layers here, we see that they basically dive all the way down underneath the top of the mountain. And then essentially wrap up and come back out on the other side. That's what that mountain is. Basically just a big massive shape line. Okay, so we're kind of out here on the, the western limb of that syncline. We're seeing that, that limb of the syncline where all the layers are basically pointing and dipping off to the east. If we were to look at these same rocks over on the other side, they'd be dipping off to the west in the opposite direction. Because these rock layers are also dipping, that's helpful for us because they're dipping at a steeper angle than the dip of the road, meaning as we essentially walk from here, we're up here at the top, and here's the new market limestone. As we walk down the road, we will essentially be walking up section, right? So these layers were all horizontal, Oldest here at the bottom, youngest at the top, they get tilted and folded. And so now as we walk along the outcrop, we're basically moving into younger and younger rocks. So that's that's helpful as a geologist. We don't we can one spot and get a whole bunch of stuff. Something else on this chart to notice, uh, I'll mention quickly, you got this upper most Beekman town group, it's another type of limestone. It basically is outcropping over there. We we passed a few road crops there. You get a kind of 
find it probably poking out down here along the base of the creek, uh, but it's not particularly exciting. There's nothing great to see there, but know that it's there. We just we skipped that one and moved into the new market. Up top here, you'll see some environmental information. Over here at the very far end, kind of where we are, it says passive margin. And then everything over here says convergent margin. So the changes we're gonna see are gonna be a result of this orogeny that takes place. Notice down here when we were in the Conoco Cheek, uh, they had it listed here as a divergent continental margin. So basically nothing really was going on. But now that we've moved into the Ordovician, we're about to get into this, what's listed here is the Taconic or Taconian orogeny. Okay, so that's gonna produce some changes that we're gonna see. But for right now, that's not happening yet. Taconian orogeny is, is yet to arrive, it hasn't happened. And so we're sitting out here and basically what has been interpreted as a, a sort of tidal, you know, or subtidal region, very shallow marine waters. And we're gonna see that as this convergent margin, basically as that Taconian orogeny kicks in, it's gonna cause some changes to the environment and we're gonna see differences in the stone as a reflection of that. But what do we see here at this one? Well, if we look very closely here, and it's nice that we've got some sunlight, if you look down in these sort of very light gray areas, you might catch occasionally some little sparkles. Yeah. There's yeah. some little tiny crystals in there. Yeah. Those are crystals of calcite. So, bring oh. so again, if you know, if we hit this with acid, you know, I should get some nice fizzing reaction. I'm just gonna. Oh, that pretty cool. Yes. Oh. Okay, I've got some witnesses. It definitely fizz. If anybody wants to see acid react on limestone, I got a bottle. We'll, we'll do it again. Uh, but we verified it is, in fact, limestone. Those little crystals that you see up close, those are crystals of calcite. It's what they describe here as fenestral limestone. Uh, you might sometimes see it as re uh, referred to as bird's eye. And basically, in these sort of very shallow tidal, intertidal regions that are sometimes subaerial, where they're sometimes exposed to the atmosphere. You've maybe even seen oh, this if you've been at the beach where the waves are kind of lapping like in the sand. One. I see like little air bubbles, like air kind of popping up or little bubbles that kind of arrive and show up in the sand, little openings. The same thing's happening in this, what would have been soft, limey mud. You get little air pockets that form in there. Well, those air pockets get preserved. And then over time, with just a little groundwater percolation and a little bit of dissolution, those little cavities basically that's just get nice filled one. in Actually. with calcite, calcium carbonate. Yeah. So that's what those little crystals are. And that's what they refer on this chart to as fenestral limestone. But it basically just tells you you got some pretty shallow, sort of subaerial uh, environment here, exposed to the atmosphere, shallow marine. Uh, it's very similar to what we saw in the Conoco Cheek, but probably a little bit more shallow at this point. Um, but those little crystals tell us that, kind of give us that hint that, yeah, it was definitely in the atmosphere at times. Yeah. Oh, I was just wondering, so like the texture here, um, do you think this would be like raindrops that eroded it? Right. Very... So, see any biolite? So yeah, so if you guys were to come and look at this sort of surface, which would be a, a bedding surface, this would have been an original sort of flat part of the, uh, you know, sort of deposit. You got this kind of knobbly weathering effect. It's very rugged. And that's really it. It's, it's just from rain and water landing on these rocks, a little bit of acidity in that water just dissolves that limestone a little bit at a time. And it uh, creates this kind of very sort of rugged, knobbly texture. Uh, they actually call it sometimes tear pants weathering. Maybe because if you like slide down on it, it will tear your pants. So tear pants weathering, it, it is actually a term. Um, and it's usually <laughs> referred with limestones because you just get that kind of uh, weather. Yeah. Okay. So it just depends. So like, uh, like you see, like maybe like right along. Oh, it's actually there might be a, sunlight. It's all it's like there might glittery. be a few little crystals in there. There's certainly a glitteriness to it, but you might see a few slightly larger crystals that catch the light. Oh yeah, there were like one or and, two. And obviously it's going to vary. Some you know some pieces might have more than others. It's um, kind of cool. So. It's and definitely with uh, along, like, here. Yeah. I should I should have brought another one, but like with like you know like a hand lens or you know throw it under you know like hold on to it, you can throw it under a microscope and right. lab or something like that. You right. get a nice. Okay. Oh yeah, nice we'll be definitely view. definitely be keeping this one. So. <laughs>
a souvenir. I think I think you have to stay like there and then you'll get it. I mean, we got yeah, water like, kind of percolate like, through that fracture, like, and as it sort of dissolves a little bit of limestone, it also then will reprecipitate, oh, okay. as in much more pure calcite. You get those nice crystals. Like sort of like so what about this? So there's these horse grays. <laughs> yeah, can't tell if that's something or not. I actually, um, on the sides, I actually oh, yeah. see these things, but... Okay, so you're saying that... So some of the... Some of them have, like, oh, eroded a little bit, like... Yes. Calcite. So there's definitely some, like, nice crystals in there of calcite. This is pretty good. This is a whole plane And I... Yeah, so what I think you actually have, I can see a little... There's... A few little cross sections of what looks yeah, like yeah. a little shelled organism. Yeah, I, it definitely, mean, it definitely think, does I think look some like. Of these little round things are, they're probably what they call ostracods. Oh, That's yes. And of course, that. in the seminar, we talk about those there, but normally they tend to be very small or micro. Right. So they're, they're pretty and, small, but, but they can get sort of just small little bean size where you can kind of make out like there's a little thing. I think there's a few of those in there. Hello? Yeah, I wouldn't, I don't, I don't doubt it, but that's definitely something since it is an organism, even though it's not very big, like, even though it doesn't sound very exciting, but of course, it's definitely something, and it definitely does look like something. And also yeah. there is more of the this reddish or brownish coloring right here. So what you guys like if you look right here. You guys see a really obvious difference between this stuff here and this stuff down there. Yeah. Can you see the? Yeah. There's like there's some layering going on here. It's darker. Definitely. You can just definitely see there's there's a series of layers here. So there's definitely been a change in the type of limestone. These are still limestones. We should still get some fizzing on these, but it's a little different than the stuff over there. There's been a change, a change in the environment. Aha. Uh -huh. Now. Even some folks have been out here doing some kind of. I think they're trying to shore the line. Now, apart. you could for the longest time. Um, it's more of a marker. I, I've actually been coming to this outcrop since like the early 2000s when I took geology at George Mason. One of the instructors who has since retired actually did a lot of his field work on this outcrop here, and so that was why they brought us here. Uh, and lots of other universities come here. You actually had a somewhat well-known famous if there are such things as famous outcrops this is kind of kind of one of them a lot of universities bring students here for the longest time i was always under the impression that this is the contact this is the actual official contact between new market limestone and the lincolnshire now somebody did come a, a sedimentologist who is more well versed in things came and burst my bubble there's actually a spot sort of in between here where the official contact is. If you were to get up really, really close with your hand lens, you can see that the new market's really fine. And other than a few of those speckles of calcite crystals in there, it's really a fine stuff. But this stuff actually gets a little grainier. Car up. So visually, it really looks like, oh my gosh, this is the obvious spot where things change. It's actually a little further back, but yeah. Oh, Maybe it's just faulted. Yeah, so so you're gonna get a lot of breaks and fractures in these rocks. Yeah. And of course this, and this being one of the, the be, 
In this case, no. There's just been maybe a little displacement. And and the event that's happening would be one of the one of if not the first of all the major mass extinction events on our planet around 450 or 445 million years ago. And also, our planet went through an ice age, explaining the darker rocks. So meaning the planet started to become colder. No, I think I'm. No, I think it's just like you're thinking maybe on the here. I think it's just erosion. This swirl looks kind of interesting. Yes, so this is sort of a much later feature. This is stuff that's happened not when this stuff was being deposited, but much Okay, it's still something. When these rocks went from being horizontal and, and much later in what's known as the Allegheny and Aragi, this is basically when Pangaea comes together. That's what takes all these layers that have been horizontal and kind of crumples them up. And when that crumpling happens, I mean, rocks, I mean, there's they have a certain amount of give in, in geology and, and on that scale, but they're still brittle. They still fracture. They still pop open. So you get these little fractures and openings, but then later get refilled in with calcite, like pure mineral calcite. So remember, water can kind of percolate through these rocks, dissolves a little bit of that calcium carbonate, and then it will re-precipitate, filling in gaps and voids and fractures with just pure mineral calcite. And that's what all this white stuff is. So the white stuff you see here is just, just basically the mineral calcite that's filled in little voids and fractures. And there's some really cool ones I'm gonna show you just a little ways down here. But the main thing to sort of maybe uh, take note of at this spot is there's been a definitive change in environment here. We also start to see some layering that we haven't seen here before. And we're basically starting to get into just a slightly deeper environment. Okay. Now I got to be careful because I want to walk along here. There is a spot here where I believe we find some fossils. So. Everybody on the board. <laughs> okay, so uh, whoever finds the first wins. Nope. Oh, okay. So now before we get to uh, the fossils, they're they're coming. Something else that's interesting and, and unique, kind of definitive about this formation, that sort of helps us identify it as such. So again, on this. This chart here, they list the Lincolnshire as being a cherty limestone. And they've kind of drawn these little blobs in there on the brick pattern. Well, here they are. If you look at this aircraft, you can see there's all these little kind of black blebs and blobs in here. These are basically black chert nodules, as they would say. So you've got a limestone here made of calcium carbonate, but you've got all these little blebs and blobs of what are essentially silica, quartz, uh -huh. siliceous material, really, right? So the stuff that's not going to really erode, it's not going to, you know, dissolve. I'm not, the acid's not going to react. Yeah, I'm just, it shouldn't. Oh. Yeah, you see, there's no oh, fizzing sorry. happening there. Hopefully, but there on the limestone, it definitely reacts. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. What's the white? So all this white that you see is basically calcite. Oh, that's and I that's figured out. Gotcha. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's what you're saying. Gotcha. So you know, one of the questions, but I'm not an expert. When we talk about church, look how nice it is. Yeah. I think it was from some one drilling. Producing mostly limestone, this is all soft carbonate mud at some point. Where does all this silica come from? Where is this like delicious material? Why is it like just little blebs and blobs of it? What's what's going on there? I don't know if this is the explanation, but it's the explanation I've been told, and I kind of like it. Is that if you imagine a shallow seafloor, you've got a lot of planktonic life that's living up there in the, the upper, you know, part of the sea seawater. And they're living and thriving, doing their thing, but they eventually die. Those uh, different uh, 
plankton, radiolarians, diatoms that make their shells, their tests out of silica, that all settles down to the seafloor. And if you imagine kind of a ripple bottom seafloor, you get little pockets, little depressions where the currents will kind of accumulate material. And so I've been told that like you get little pockets on the seafloor where all this little planktonic silica material will kind of gather up and kind of accumulate in little pockets. And of course, eventually it gets buried, gets compressed, you get millions of years of chemical alteration and you end up producing little black dark pockets here of chert, silica. All that silicious material kind of gets fused into these chert nodules. There may be other explanations. They call it diagenesis, just sort of this, you know, the groundwater percolates through and leaves deposits. And, you know, there may be some other chemical explanations for it, but I always kind of liked that to think that, yeah, it's, it's kind of the remnants of preserved silicious plankton material that was accumulating in little, you know, pockets on the seafloor. But don't take my word for it. That may not be the story at all. So, but that's, yeah, that's, I, just the that's, I, that's the story I like. So, yeah, I actually like that story too. And it actually <laughs> does make a lot of sense since it is a oh, yeah. shallow marine environment and especially with a lot of sunlight. So, so you'll see, like, they would have been at these very hurt. They're, they're all over for them. And sort of the, the wrinkled, crinkly nature of these layers lends me to believe that there's probably a little bit of algae uh, going on here as well. But I want to see if I can find our, our fossil here. Oh, I think someone found it. I don't know, I'm looking at this Oh yes, I see a little oh, yeah, oister or, or a clam. So you guys should, everybody should kind of come up here and, you and see a little. Examine this area right in here. <laughs> You'll actually find there's a whole what? lot of, maybe not a whole lot, but there are a lot of brachiopods. There definitely is. Little cats and moles. And it's, again, these are like tilted here, sedimentary layers. So here, we're getting, here, we're at here. Essentially, what was once a horizontal bedding plane, fossils and organisms are basically accumulating on that seafloor. You know, they've since been tilted, but you're basically looking at a fossil rich layer. You can sit here and look at them down here, but we can essentially trace them all the way up to the outcrop. And so, so you know, this, we won't, we we won't be- We would call this fossiliferous limestone then? Right, so- Definitely, with so all so these brachiopods, which are very defined, though a lot of them say, hey, sure be fragmented. Oh, yeah. So we've actually, like I said, we've actually moved. So, right, so we started. Ah, there's a, there's a bracket pond right there. <laughs> oh, yes. <laughs> that right here. Oh, that's uh, a really good one, actually. Where's the other bracket pond, you say? Right there. I, I shout it out. And there's a bunch more over here. Oh yeah. Real good on that. Good right there. I don't want to see that. I'm hoping to see the really big guy. Like those monster, monster sea scorpions and giant porcupines. Uh, what are those called? You mean your reptorids? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Those. I mean. And also the orphicones, which include Camerocerus. That's the one I was thinking about. Yeah, and it grew to be about 20 feet long, whereas the sea one of the sea scorpions or Eurypterids being the goal of craft is between the one, which would be the one from Chase by Sea Monsters, course can grow to be about actually smaller than that. The largest one was only 8 foot. But yeah, close. Oh yes, that's a perfect one, actually. All right, so hopefully you guys saw some of those brachiopods there. What, what I wanted to mention again is there's other fossils to be found here. Uh, uh, 
Yeah, I mean, I vote oh, all the way over there. I already found some ostracods. But yeah, definitely more than just the brachiopods. All right, guys, so a couple more things. We've seen these chirp nodules. Right. If you know how to look. We also do have trilobites in here. But unlike some of the really cool ones you saw in lab where you had a nice full body specimen, we typically don't find those here. In fact, I, I almost guarantee you're not going to see any trilobites at this outcrop, but they're here. Not they're today, at least. This image here is just one of many, but little tiny trilobite pieces. These are basically taken with the microscope. You need to see these. To see them, you kind of have to look at them under the microscope. But they're little trilobite parts. They're basically been solidified. So in terms of preservation, I talked to some of you guys about uh, a type of preservation called replacement, where original shell material gets replaced with some new mineral. Oftentimes it's pyrite, you know, pyritization. That's pretty cool. But it could be other things. You can replace the original shell material with something just like the silica. It becomes silicious, short. And that's what's happened here with these guys. So some of the same processes that probably led to the formation of all those chert nodules, at least in my mind, probably had some influence. There was must have been enough silica in the, the system here to start replacing the chitinous material that the trilobites make their shells out of and replacing with silica. So how do we get this stuff out of here? Well, if we were to take break chunks of this stuff off, bring them back to the lab, and this has been done, and essentially dissolve. This is limestone. It reacts and dissolves with acid. So if we just dissolve all the acid away, or the, dissolve all the calcium carbonate away with the acid, what we get left with is the non-dissolvable parts, which include the siliceous trilobite parts. So if you dissolve a chunk of this limestone, I would really anticipate that if you dissolve the limestone away, you might find a whole bunch of little trilobite parts, essentially, that would come sort of weathering out of that dissolved limestone, along with maybe some other cool stuff as well. So. The point is that there's there's fossil evidence in here besides the stuff that you can see with your naked eye. There's stuff that you really would have to get back to the lab, <laughs> kind of extract from the limestone. But you might actually have a lot of stuff to look at and examine. So, you know, people have done this. And so I just wanted to point it out. You won't see a trilobite poking out here, but they're around. They're here. All right. Okay. More changes as we move into the next formation. Yeah, yeah. 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 So, like I said, I, I've been coming to this, this outcrop for you know many years now. <laughs> and I swear when I first came here, I don't think these things were hanging out quite as far. I feel like it's already like weathered back. You know, maybe a good foot or so. I don't know, but it just, I don't, when I first came, I don't ever remember it being like. Yeah, which is why they're very, Flaky, and I found one right here, and I think these might be chunks of coral. So, just to kind of read it, we've moved up a little further. Ah, we're into the no, I don't have like a really good spot to point to here to say, ah, this is the contact where we, we left, you know, officially left the Lincoln Shire and, and moved into this one. But you hopefully notice. This does not look like the limestones we were just looking at over there, and certainly not the new market that we started with. This stuff looks really dirty. There's a lot of this sort of light-colored shaley material coming out here. You've got to get a sense on the ground. It's very light, tan in color. It's not dark like the actual limestone. So, so these are still limestones, but they've gotten darker. And there's all this other sort of stuff interbedded. So something else is going on here. Yeah, it's like, yeah. I thought you were talking about the like A lot of this shaley stuff that you see down in here. Like, okay, well, if we're out in this marine environment, where's this stuff coming from? Why is it mixed in with limestone? And so there's been some correlation that was like suggesting that, well, perhaps this big bent or uh, this Milbrig bed, and they call it over in Europe the same large, thick bentonite layer. They call it uh, the big bentonite. There was speculation that perhaps these two bentonites are correlated, that they're the same ash layer or volcanic layer. <clears throat> so they did some work on that, did a little radiometric dating, 
These are volcanic ash layers, so although they're kind of clay-like, there's enough mineral content in there you can do some radiometric dating. They got radiometric age dates of around 454 million years ago for both the Millbrig bed and the Big Bentonite. So again, we're not looking at the Millbrig bed, but kind of think of this as being really close to that. <laughs> they also looked at fossil evidence at both locations in North America and in Europe. They looked at things like some conodonts. So some of you guys, I, I showed you guys some conodonts in lab, good index fossils. They can use those to correlate. They used some, another organism we haven't seen, something called graptolites. But essentially they looked at these organisms, kind of matching them up with the, what they saw in both North America and in Europe. And it was looking pretty good. Like, yeah, there seems to be some good correlation here. So this must have been a really large volcanic eruption. Something on the order of, if I get the number, 1,100 cubic kilometers, which uh, if you know about Mount St. Helens, it'd be like 400 times the size of a Mount St. Helens eruption. Just, just let's just say it, really big, really big eruption. Yeah. Enough, you know, that ash got deposited all the way over in Europe, uh, you know, deposited here. I mean, we're not all together yet. We're still kind of separated by an ocean basin. So it must have been pretty big. So another question that might arise from such a large eruption would be, was there any kind of a extinction associated yeah, I, I, with I, I was, that? How, how that would up. organisms handle such an event? Well, <clears throat> they and looked at that too. So they looked. Yes, at there is an extinction. I, I well, did. We got brachiopods. We did looked at some graptolites, looked at conodots, and also these chitinozoa. So basically, four groups of organisms. And what they found was that for the most part, other than a few, a couple brachiopod groups, a couple conodon groups, everybody seemed to sail right through. There was no disappearance of any organisms. They all seemed to be before and after the event. So at least this volcanic eruption would appear to have not been at least a major killer, but still a little curious given that it, it's so large. So all this work was done back in the early 90s. And like a lot of things, it doesn't always sit well with everybody. So a few folks are like, yeah, I don't know. That just still doesn't seem right. So, you know, to be the buzzkills, they decided to do a geochemical analysis of both of these bentonite layers. And what they found is essentially looking for a unique geochemical signature, kind of like a fingerprint. When they plotted the geochemical data after their analysis, they found that the big bentonite and the Millbrig bed essentially had different chemistries to them. And so that different chemistry would definitely then suggest that, ah, these are not in fact the same eruption, mm -hmm. but they were just two separate distinct eruptions that happened roughly around the same time, were large, but one affecting North America, the other Europe, but two distinctly separate volcanic mm -hmm. events. And it's not large enough to be- So, and then not large enough to, to, to be the big, a big extinction kind of event. Okay, okay. Explain the shelves here, or did, did you know like yeah, these why old, these things? Yeah. Are... So it, I think the main thing that's happening right here is just a classic case of differential weathering. Mm -hmm. The the fact that this stuff down here it's really loose, oh, God, easily so erodible. Yeah. You know, this stuff's just weathering away much faster, and I've got just these nice solid kind of layers or blocks here that are now poking out in high relief. And so this is, it's only a matter of time before, you know, at some point, they'll, 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 they'll be laying here on the these thing. These are the limestone, and then these, the stuff is, you can pick apart with your fingers, that's the ash. So that's and then the like, ash. These, these sort of more uh, massive and pieces, these, these probably, are the limestone. That's the limestone? Yeah, so on that, that uh, chart, you only grab this it out here. On this one, they lo show this formation, they listed as cobbly limestone. Yeah. So, oh, you know, yeah. essentially what's going on here, and I should have mentioned it. One other thing to mention here. We've essentially gotten deeper. We started off in the new market really shallow. And now we're like in relatively deeper waters here. So something that's happening, if I've got a volcanic island chain that's coming in and it's colliding here now with North America, it's putting pressure. And so we're kind of sitting here on the, the western side of that mountain building event. That pressure tends to bow the crust down here on the backside. So what started off as shallow is now just getting deeper and deeper and allowing more and more sediment to start flushing into the, the, the scene. And of course, we've got volcanoes now that are erupting. And so ash is coming off those volcanic eruptions and accumulating. So it's still oceanic and marine enough to get limestone, but 
I've got a lot more clastic material and volcanic ash material that's kind of washing into the scene here. So, uh, so if we were standing in the middle of the ocean, would the trees be all covered up? <laughs> we're actually standing right in the ocean. Yeah, we're yeah. standing in the deep ocean. Yeah, we'd be. Yes, they would definitely. We would pretty much even the mountains would be. Prop well up over there would be. Would be could would be below the waves. Yeah, I know we get too. Yeah, so that's definitely got some stuff in there. Yeah, definitely. Oh look, a nice looking shell right there. Does anybody have any questions about and another one. just the, the outcrops here? I got one other thing I just want to point out across and the street. Some coral. Right? Some coral. Everybody good? Yeah, I guess so. Alright. Kind of, we're going to kind of walk back over to where the vehicles are, but I want to point something out over on the other side here. What, what we're looking at here, well, something, this is tumbling run. It's tumbling down, of course, over these rocks. These rocks are dipping at an angle. They tend to kind of poke up out, uh, on the surface and it creates a series of little little mini waterfalls as it sort of tumbles its way down. All this water, a lot of it's groundwater, it's percolating through these limestones. It's dissolving some of that calcium carbonate uh, into the, the water. And so that water is finding it, or that calcium carbonate dissolved is finding its way into these streams flowing along. And when the water gets agitated, in other words, when it goes over the waterfalls and there's some oxygen and it's bubbling, I'm not a, a chemist, I don't exactly understand why, but that facilitates the precipitation of that calcium carbonate. Basically, it's dissolved, but it, it re-precipitates again. It starts to build up as fresh new limestone, a limestone that we would call travertine. You guys remember the travertine? It's the one limestone that we really didn't associate with the marine environment. In, in lab, we basically said caves and hot springs. Well, basically any environment like this, where you've got a lot of limestone and maybe even flowing creeks, you can produce some fresh travertine. It doesn't have to be a hot spring or in a cave. So over time, as this stream has been tumbling, it's created essentially a travertine ledge here. So if you wanna think about the rocks we're seeing today and you wanna sort of pinpoint the youngest rock, the youngest one you saw today, it might be right down there where that stream's flowing, fresh, brand new travertine being deposited as we speak. So the youngest rocks of the day, we skipped all the way up to the top of the field. All right. Yeah. I know why it does. Why does it do that? So because it's kind of falling there and it's getting mixed up, it's being exposed to more air. And I think it's actually the CO2 that comes in and causes it to precipitate. Okay. That makes sense. That makes sense. Cool. So, anyways, there you go. So all these little waterfalls along here will kind of tend to produce these little travertine ledges. Fresh, fresh limestone, but not marine. All right, okay, shallow marine limestones. We went to Tumbly Run, start off still nice shallow marine, but we get that Taconia and Orogeny happening. It's starting to bow the crust down, deepening our basin. It's filling up uh, with more clastic sediment. And eventually it's going to get to the point where the mountains from the Taconian Raji have been built up so large that the sediment that they're spewing out into this basin, and something else to kind of consider here, let me step back a second. Remember, when we started off in our shallow marine ocean basin in the Conoco Chief, we were kind of like what you could think of as being outside, on the outside of the continent, on sort of the outside of the, 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 you know, on the outer coast. Those volcanic islands come and crash into North America, they push up mountains, and then out where we are, we get bowed down to the station. But because those mountains are being built up out here, we're no longer kind of on the outskirts of the continent. We're now, we've kind of shifted. We're in the interior. All that sediment is coming out of the Ciconian Mountains and is spewing off to the west. So we're kind of now in the interior on the inside side of those volcanic mountains. It's bowed down the crust. It's created this deep ocean basin. And we've reached a point where... There's just way too much clastic sediment coming off those volcanic mountains that you just can't have limestone anymore. And so you start getting sandstone. We drove by, hopefully you saw those nice outcrops of what have been uh, called the Oranda Shale. You can see they were obviously shale layers, really thin layers, broke off in these nice laminated kind of sheets. Uh. But when we get over here, we don't really have that anymore. And it's a little hard to tell because the rocks here are really discolored and weathered. But if you look over on the side, you should be able to see this. You've got these sort of really thick, yeah. solid yeah. 
kind of layers. And then this really easily brittle, broken up material, kind of in between. Essentially, you've got inner bedded layers of shale, and in this case, it's gray wacky sandstone. Okay, so one of the things that we can see, if we were to take some of this, this rock here, you know, and, and break it off and, and maybe cut it open and polish it up, what we would probably find in there is a whole lot of graded beds. We would find that at the bottom, we would have more coarse sand and they would get finer and finer and finer, eventually getting us into a nice little shale layer. And then boom, you'll get another package of gray wacky sand again. So if you're kind of reading and interpreting these layers, in this case, the older stuff is kind of in the mountain. The younger stuff is what you're sort of looking out here closer to you. We've gotten a lot closer to Massanut Mountain here. It's right over there. So we, we moved in and we basically transitioned from shallow limestone environment to a deep environment that's now shedding all this sandstone into the basin. It's sand that hasn't had a chance to travel very far, so it's not particularly well sorted. It's not a coarse rich sandstone. It has a slightly different composition. It's not an arcos, but it's full of all this, you know, unsorted sandy material with some mud that occasionally gives you graded beds and then feeds into these calmer, lower energy time periods where you're just depositing shale. One thing to kind of consider, these big, thick, solid packages that would be sandstone, a lot of those were probably deposited relatively quickly. They were probably part of what we would sometimes refer to as these turbidity currents, right? So you get this kind of slump of material that you know, goes rushing off into the deep water, carrying all the sediment with it in suspension, and then it eventually settles down, and that's what gives you that graded bed. And this process happens time and time again. And particularly in a, in a situation where we've got tectonic activity nearby. There's volcanoes that are colliding into North America. They're erupting. They're probably causing some earthquakes now and again. And what better thing to send a big pile of sand down into the deep than, you know, get a little shaking going and whoop, there's your turbidity current, a new graded bed emerges. And then things return to relatively calm for a good while. And you're just slowly depositing fine muds and silt, clays, until the next maybe trigger event that sends another slough of sand down into the deep again. So basically that's what we are uh, looking at here. Let me see, I feel like I... Okay, yeah, so unfortunately the, the outcrop here is very weathered. It's covered with lichens. Uh, it's really hard to even tell what it is. And so this is why as geologists, we always bring those rock hammers so we can break off fresh pieces because I, I wouldn't be able to really interpret much just looking mm. at what I'm seeing right here. It's just too dirty and, and weathered to, to make that distinction. But if I could kind of get inside that rock a little bit, pull a fresh chunk out, then, then we would see all of these, these cool features. But what you can definitely see is that alternating pattern of shale, sandstone, shale, sandstone. And that's all these graded beds, just kind of one after another, right? Right there. Lawyer, you told us there would be more fossils and green more trilobites, right, but yet we find down, nothing. One more thing down here. This is kind of a relatively quick stop. We had two options. Oh, the one that we accidentally broke. <laughs> that's okay, that's okay. Uh, so it's kind of telling the same story we just, just saw over there, but I just wanted to point something out because I think you, you can kind of really see it nicely here. So you can see we've got this sort of thick package here. This is our sandstone. We've got these sort of weaker shaley layers here. And you see how they're, you know, they're kind of breaking off. Oh, yep, like, there you go. Okay, so you, know, you see how they're breaking off in that direction. Yeah. What I want to mostly point out here is that that breakage area in that shell, that's not the original bedding. Okay, so normally when we think of shale and they break off in layers, you're like, oh, that's like, you know, that's one layer, layer, the next layer comes off. <laughs> but think about it, these layers have been folded. Their actual true bedding orientation is, this is like this. It's dipping mm -hmm. that direction. So the cutting that you see, that layering that's going this way is something else. That isn't bedding, but that's a product basically of, of tectonic activity of when these rocks essentially got folded. And it tells you a little story about the resistance of some rocks versus others. Mm -hmm. So during that folding, when these layers got kind of turned into this big syncline, the sandstones are pretty resistant. 
And so through that folding, they kind of maintain their competency. They sort of stay together as a solid formation. But those shales are made up of silts and clays, much weaker material. And so they feel the strain of that folding. Mm -hmm. And so they begin to break. And that breakage basically is happening perpendicular to the direction of pressure. So the pressure is kind of coming in on either side, creating the fold. And within that fold, mm. you get breakage essentially perpendicular to the direction of folding. That is crazy. And that's what you're seeing there. You can oh. see that it's folded. But the, the breakage pattern of those shales is almost straight up and down, yeah. perpendicular. So that's a tectonic feature from the folding, and it's just a statement of how resistant the sandstone is versus the shale. The shale can't handle it, and it starts to snap and break into a bunch of fractures, and it produces that cleavage that you see there. In some situations where you've got nice layered shales that want to break off in layers, and then you get tectonic breakage, you get something, something called pencil cleavage, where they just sort of break off in these sort of thin pencil-like shapes. And every once in a while, you can find a few examples laying around here, but it's more the idea that, you know, they're just kind of breaking off in little thin sort of pencil-like shapes. That's not a good example, but anyway, point is that you got breakage here as a result. That's not the layering of the shale. That's from tectonics. And that sort of breakage that happens in that fold happens on large scales as well. So we're right here looking at a meander of the North Fork of the Shenandoah River. And if you were to look at a topographic map of this area, we're just a little off this map of this here, but you can see there's these crazy meanders here. And it's not unusual for a river to meander, but what is unusual is for those meanders to have these straight parallel patterns to them. You know, you expect it to be a little more sinuous than that. So there's, there's got to be something going on there. Well, it's kind of the same story on a larger scale. When that folding's happening, and you get that, that sort of pressure from the tectonic uh, collision, just as this shale kind of broke perpendicular to the pressure, you can get the same thing on a large scale, where essentially you can see these ridges right here of, uh, you know, basically what would be the Massanutten mountain range there. So the pressure was coming from this direction and this direction, creating the big synclinal fold. But because of that pressure, it creates some tension that creates a bunch of series of fractures to essentially pop open perpendicular to the direction of pressure. <clears throat> so beneath this here, or essentially they're not really faults, but large scale fractures that opened up during that tectonic collision. That fracture there, weakens the rock, it breaks it up a little bit. So now when the water starts to flow and is etching out the landscape, it finds those areas of weakness and now basically takes advantage of them and basically runs along those fractures there. Yeah. So you're saying that the river is it, uh, like back before the continents slammed into each other, it was originally like straight, but because of that, it kind of like crumpled. So, so, so well, yeah, so certainly like before, before the collision, like none of this was even here, right? So, I mean, we're in a completely different kind of environment, but at some point in time after, you know, the cons have collided, Pangea is broken apart. These once Himalayan sized Appalachian mounds have been eroding away. Essentially erosion has been kind of carving out the landscape. And I've told some of you guys that, you know, sandstones, those are the ridge formers, the rocks that kind of are going to poke out in high relief. They're more resistant. Shales and limestones, especially here in a humid climate, they're going to erode and dissolve away much more quickly, forming our valleys. And so essentially, as you know, that's what we're kind of seeing here. And the river's a part of that story as it started wearing down the landscape. And when it eventually found these areas of weakness, it just like, hey, I'm going to exploit that area of weak. Water's looking for the path of least resistance, quickest way to the sea. And, oh, here's some nice broken up rubbly rock that I can just start, you know, cruising right on through. So just something if you look and you'll see the same thing. If you look at the south fork of the Shenandoah River, which is over on the other side, you'll see the same exact pattern. So on either side of this large syncline, you have these big kind of fractures that sort of popped open. You know, not like big chasms, but basically fracturing in the rock, breaking it up, making it a little more brittle, easily to erode. And so the river is going to exploit that. So another interesting wrinkle to the story. Ha ha. ha, ha. <laughs> all right. Um, so that's basically all I have to say about the Martinsburg formations. From here, 
we can uh, trek our way back to the McDonald's where we'll, you know, have some lunch and kind of hang out for a few. And then when we're all ready and, you know, feeling well fed, we can uh, move on for the afternoon journey. The uh, Massanutten Sandstone. So you can see we've, we've actually now jumped up into the Silurian. You can see on this chart also that we're essentially kind of at the end of the Ciconian orogeny here. It's, it's basically winding down, it's coming to a conclusion. And so picking up where we left off, we had this sort of deepening ocean basin that was happening kind of on the, the back side of that mountain building event. It bowed the crust down, created that basin. All that gray, wacky sand was spilling in, graded beds. Well, eventually that basin has started to fill up and the mountains that have been building up are wearing down, getting smaller. The sediment that's coming off of those mountains now has further distance that it can travel, more time for it to get eroded and sorted, well sorted in fact, to the point that we end up with quartz rich sandstone. So that's basically what you're standing on. And again, it may not look, you can see these dark patches, that's all just weathering. That's from water running off here. There's some moss, some lichens, all these things kind of cover and obscure the rock. So. You know, again, when you look at this, it's not necessarily obvious that that's what it is, but it is sandstone. It's also the rock that's making up the ridges of Massanutten. So these sort of high ridges you see above here, that's Massanutten sandstone that's cropping out. Now, there are some interesting things to see here I want to point out. You've actually walked over some of them just behind you there. There's a few more here. But we have basically some trace fossils here. You see these little kind of linear marks here in the stone? Oh, yeah. These little grooves here? So basically, these are these are horizontal, you know, bedding traces of worms that would have been slithering along, you know, the flat bottom of this sandy bottom. So we're still kind of in a marine environment. We're probably still yeah, under the water. Environment, but we're though. really close to the shore. We're essentially in an extremely we're, we're, shallow water. We're transitioning from a tectonic mountain building event to a return to just a passive calm again, to where there's no plates colliding, nothing happening. The, the mountain building event is essentially kind of running its course, it's winding down. And we're going to have. And also some of the first little calm period. life on That's land starts to appear during this time in the Silurian, by the way, being so, between between so, 445 to 419 million years ago. Yeah, so lots of things going on. Now, one of the things where you can tell a little bit of the composition of this rock that I can find it. It's a little bit pebbly. We would maybe call this a little bit conglomeritic. So, although the overall package is sandstone, you have some areas of some conglomerate in here. There's stuff that didn't get quite as worn down as the rest. Oh, kitty, I'm good. And the other sediment Whoa. <laughs> Yeah, I got my foot in it already. Man. Woo! Now that is cold. Now you would not want to fall in there by accident. Especially since on land already it's like only about the mid 40s. By this ledge here, so you can look at it and you can actually see the unweathered surface. You'll see along the side here some really lovely cross bedding. Oh, wow. So you definitely kind of have to be down here and you just look That's underneath. So cool. The rock here has been protected. So you can see a side angle view of those cross beds. So I'm gonna I'm gonna swap places so make your way up from here. Look down under here and see the crossbeds, and then uh, we'll reconvene over here. Oh my god.
There's trace fossils you can see right there. These different sedimentary layers, look at the cross bedding, and it's maybe no real shock or surprise, but sure enough, the cross bedding, the dominant current direction, tends to show a kind of a fan-like deposit to sort of splay out, pointing towards the west. So it's just kind of a, you know, validating our interpretations that you've got these mounds, they're shedding sediment to the west, and if we had any doubt, the cross bedding is another bit of evidence that confirms that story, that interpretation. But yeah, these are definitely sediments moving dominantly in that direction. It's not to say there's not a little crisscrossing here and there, but large scale and then broadly looking across the entire east coast, there's multiple deposits of this kind of stuff that show that they were just fanning and shedding off those ancient mountains there. The other thing I'd maybe want to mention here, we sort of spent, that's part of the day, we started off, remember, in marine limestones. We moved up a little bit higher. We started getting a little more plastics in the scene. We eventually get into some shales. We get into some uh, gray, wacky sandstones. And now we're into this really clean, quartz, well-sorted quartz sandstone. We've essentially gotten a sequence that started off very fine carbon material and has gotten coarser and coarser as we've moved up. Does anybody remember what type of sequence that would indicate? Yeah, so it's definitely a transgressive or regressive sequence. Does anybody have a hazard a guess as to which one it would be if we went from fine moving up into coarse? Not so. Yeah, no, sorry. I, I was all excited. Like, yeah. So this would be regression, but again, this is not a regression caused by sea level dropping. This isn't a global sea level change. This is tectonics at work, taking a shallow marine basin, deepening it up to make it deeper to fill it with sediment, building up mountains nearby, shedding all that plastic stuff in there. So it's not a global sea level rise in this case. This is just tectonics at work deepening the basin, filling it up with sediment, <coughs> taking us from those limestones and the shallow marine <coughs> tropical environment to now sort of this, you know, package of dirty sandstones and eventually clean quartz or sandstone. This big syncline and then you know, kind of bats it up on the other side. If you look at this stuff here, you'll see there's really not a lot of layering going on here. It's hard to even see if there's any layers at all. It's pretty massive bedded sandstone. Basically, this is kind of, I wouldn't even say it's a sandstone. It's really more of a sandstone. When everything we've seen so far today has been tilted. Is it it's newer? Is it a newer? It's Looking at here would be part of the Helderberg group. So this group that's a little bit further down, just a little bit, not too far above the Massanut and Sandstone. So if you just sort of think, you know, there's the, the sort of the Western limb that we've spent most of the day over there. We've kind of moved over to this side. So we're now, we're kind of on the Eastern limb of this uh, syncline. There's definitely better places to see some of these rocks. They're actually rather thin and large some mountains started getting built up from the Taconian Arachi and the Brock Plastics in. It got uh, you know, to be sort of shaly and eventually sandy. The same thing's basically going to start happening here. Taconian Arachi may happen. Mountains are building up. And all of a sudden, we're going to start getting plastics to get here. So, and and we're far enough away from any of these orogenies that happen to basically just stay more or less horizontal. Way very deep below, you've got this layer of Marcellus shale that's capped with all this other rock, and that's where they're going to drill down and tap into those resources because they're still trapped there. The places where it's been curved and uplifted and sticking up out of the ground, you know, even over you know over long periods of geologic time, stuff. Find anything? No. So a few other things maybe I want to kind of mention. I here. thought so. All the folding, this big syncline, of course, you know, we had basically two big orogenies, the Taconi. And one thing you can notice, and I, I think, again, I have this in the, uh, the handout, but there's a little kind of arrow that you can maybe kind of make. Need more shale that we drove by before the Marcellus. And we're basically looking at something that's on our chart here, and it's kind of squeezed in between this need more shale, little thing here called Tioga bentonite. All right, so that's what this is. We're looking at the Tioga bentonite. And obviously, it must be significant enough that it deserves some space here on this stratigraphic column. 
It's not just a thin layer of, of bentonite. This is actually a pretty thick layer. At least certainly it's very thick right here. So here's another image that probably is really hard to, to, to really read, but again, it's in the handout. You can examine it more closely. It's called a, if I pronounce it right, an isopoc map. Basically showing, in this case, they've mapped out depths of the Tioga bentonite. This is basically- They built this today and they excavated a little bit, exposing some rock. This is the Mahantango formation. There are fossils to be found over there, but it's a little riskier because there's so much cactus. And every time I poke around over there, I never really stick myself. So, uh, look over there if you want, but I would recommend it. Most of the time we're able to find them. That one there, that's a that's a keeper. So so wow. there's a little little piece of trilobite there. A true yeah. keep. Is the ass of the trilobite? Let me see. Yes. I'll, I'll be looking for the official term though on the, the lab exam, but yeah. Um, I might get partial credit for that answer. Ah. I just found out. I just found out. Point credit. Point. I'm sorry. Oh uh, yeah, this. that's a pretty nice one too. Huh? Yeah. Um. Oh my god. So, yeah, after watching all that, pretty much I had a lot of fun overall. Like, like it was just a really awesome experience. I wish I could do it again or anything like it again someday. But anyway, as usual, thanks for watching. Leave a like and subscribe to watch more content on this channel every day. But from now on, Thanks for watching.